Welcome to Real Magic Review. My name is Steve Faulkner and this <clears throat> is Everything by Jamie Allen. Before I do this review, I'd like you to remember to like and subscribe. I know it, we all say it and it sounds like a broken record, but it is really important that I know you're there. And do comment underneath because I do answer the comments in the live shows. Speaking of which, uh, do press the little bell icon next to the subscribe button so you know when I go live and when I can't go live. And there's really random times uh, when I just pop it on live and have a chat. So uh, I will answer your questions then. And of course, without onlinemagic.co there is no channel so do please uh, support your magic support the channel learn from me 800 plus videos live sessions every week special guests on zoom that's onlinemagic.co have a look at that see what people are saying about it this i'd start when i get excited about a book i start it always the same way um when i was sent this by jamie i said look i don't think i'm going to be able to read all of it and review it it will take too long what I'll do is I'll skim it. There's loads of stuff about illusions anyway. Um, look at the bits I want to look at and talk about it and maybe do some, you know, Instagram stuff and talk about it. As soon as I started reading it, the same thing that always happens when it's a good book is that I couldn't stop reading it. And I said, look, I'm going to read this whole thing because I have to. I, I, as soon as I started, I thought I'm going to miss stuff if I'm not careful, but I don't have to read the illusion stuff. And then when I read the first illusion piece, I think about the helicopter, the um, uh, appearing helicopter, I then went, right, there's, this isn't just a book about illusions. This isn't just a book about tricks. There is something in every page of this. And I wasn't disappointed. I've read every single page of it. Not I'm showing off, that's what you should do with a book. I read a whole book, aren't I clever? Um, <laughs> but, uh, but also went back and got a lot out of this very unexpectedly. Idli, idli, Id yeah, whatever. I'll give you a brief idea of what this is. I'm going to interview Jamie very soon for the podcast and the show, so I'm not going to go into, I say this every time and I end up doing it, but I'm really not this time going to break down every single thing in the book. It will take way too long because there is so much in this book because it's called Everything. And it is everything, well, not every single thing that Jamie's done, but performance-wise, it covers pretty much all the bases, I reckon. But as he says at the end of the book, he hasn't called it everything because it's oh, all the stuff I've done. It it's, touches on all aspects of performance, of magic performance and production. And Jamie is someone, as he also says, that you know, there's no doubt he has a love and a passion and respect and obsession with magic. But his big thing, the thing that really does it for him is production, producing magic tricks, creating them, putting them on stage, the lighting, the design, everything. And that is really what this is all about. Now, you might hear that and say, well, I'm not going to produce big shows. And that's kind of how I came into it with the illusions. Well, I'm not going to do big illusions. But within all of those essays or or instructions or ways to build things, there are different lessons in there. And I think every single one of us can learn from that. I should have put this at the end. It's quite a nice summary, isn't it? But I'll just go. So I don't want you to switch off and go out for the illusions. It's, it's, it's not that. I came across uh, Jamie first by buying his DVDs, Play, play Small, pack, pack Small, Plays Massive, because I was really interested in doing stuff on camera, close-up stuff on stage, and I know that Jamie did this, and his DVD set was all about that, and it was great. But I remember thinking, oh, they're kind of standard tricks. I want something really special to do. And of course, now with maturity and having been on stage a lot more, I know that those things are exactly what you should be doing. So in the book, he's got, a load of close-up tricks actually and way more on them than you'd think he's got a brilliant bit on a quiver case he's got an any card at any number which is a magician fooler he's got elastic band tricks two elastic band tricks one with a deck of cards like an ambitious card with an elastic band that you do on camera which is absolutely stunning like i said all the details a version of rollover aces if you know rollover aces i think it's Derek dingle i always get that wrong i get mixed up with i think it's Derek dingle's rollover aces but if i get that wrong don't throw things at the screen uh, and, and goes into the detail of them. And importantly, he's changed them, not for the sake of changing them, but to make them play really, really strongly on a big stage with a camera or on parlor without. So you've got all the close-up tricks. You've got the illusions, the appearing helicopter, the 
he's got the first illusion that he ever sold officially. Sorry, there's loads of noise outside, it's putting me off. Two car productions, a brilliant piece on the first ever bespoke illusion that he <laughs> did at the NEC where his parents took him to the NEC to do this illusion. And I'm not gonna ruin it because I want him to talk about it in the interview. But I learned a lot, shadow productions, how to use shadows to make productions or vanishes a lot more effective. How to do things like the Million Dollar Miracle, which is now he's, he's changed it and called it the 17,444,000, yeah, that, which would be the equivalent of a million dollars now. <laughs> Terrible. Uh, I've just tried to read my own writing and it's, it's written by a child, clearly. Which is this thing of loads of people or loads of big things coming out of a small thing on stage, which is usually really obvious, but he says, no, we can do it better. We can get it right up stage and we can not look like loads of people are coming out of a, basically a curtain at the back of the stage. And he does this with lighting, with, with misdirection, with design. And for someone like me who really struggles with that side of it, I, I found it so really useful, so very useful, sorry. You know, the use of mirrors, but not in an obvious way. Taking classic, you know, old school magic concepts, that's what I'm thinking of, and bringing them up to this digital kind of magic that he performs, which is his kind of trademark now. And a lot of people say it's futuristic magic, but he's saying, no, it's not futuristic. I'm not kind of trying to be the futuristic magician. I'm the current and contemporary magician. And how to create illusions like his film to like video to, I think it's called video. Let me just have a look. Video to life productions, apologies, so much in here, where he uses, you know, a, a, a big version of a phone, hilariously, like it was way, a, a years ago, and he's like, this is in the future, and it's the iPhone 11, as if that was like way into the future. And he uses a phone, but not in the way you'd think, not like an app, he uses a phone as a magic prop and things come out of the phone, and that is used to produce a real life person or object or whatever. So all of these illusions, even though when it got to the bit where you build this, build this, well, I'm not going to build that. I learned that because all of these concepts are, of course, applicable to our close-up magic, to creating our close-up magic. And I think this is seen in the way he looks at close-up magic. The elastic band routine he does, he's kind of brought a prop in there, which looks like, that I might be wrong, but someone who thinks in that way of illusions, where how can I make that effect brilliant and not worry too much that it's, oh, it's just got to be done with one elastic band, but make it completely and utterly fooling, and fooling it really is. Origin stories can be very, very dull sometimes for magicians because they're just normal people that have done normal stuff, but James isn't. And again, I don't want to give away the story, but he's got a really wonderful story of how he got into magic. And it's way more than just, I got a magic set. I mean, he did kind of get a version of a magic set, but in a very extreme way when he went to a shop with his mum. But again, I'll let him tell you about that. But also his parents take him to see Mystique and his introduction to, to Russ Stevens. And this educated me because of course I know Russ from producing the videos and then Blackpool and of course being an illusionist I knew he was in the show but to see what effect that had on someone from a reader like me that didn't experience that with illusions I was never really there with illusions I didn't really see any live and I, I didn't really watch that much magic on telly so I got that off of different things but to see that spark that moment where you see someone and it kind of changes your life and takes you and, and, and on that trajectory into your magic and your thinking and on his thinking, when we look later at the shows, he's going back from that NEC, that sort of early production and before, to the shows that he's produced, the failures, importantly, when he talks about a big show he put on, uh, Houdini, you've got the curse of Harry Houdini, that, you know, on one level failed and talking about how he dealt with that and the string of failures. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that in a way that we all have to deal with that. If we want to take risks and achieve anything, like he has, like Jamie has, then we have to understand that there's a process and there's something, there's a, there's a way we have to go with that. And that is always going to be kickbacks, failures, and we have to learn how to deal with that. It's not avoiding them, it's learning how to deal with them. And every single one of his productions, he's come across these issues, these problems, and overcome them. And sometimes he's had to kind of really retreat and go back and work on them. So his eye magician work, his all of his illusions, his, you know, the fact he went off and sort of sourced an, an old helicopter from this kind of helicopter junkyard, which is just brilliant, and took it home and thought, right, what can we do with this then? Up to his speed bike production, now making it look like a real magic production, not something that just comes out of a massive base. The Illusionarium, this incredible 
production in Canada where it, they got stopped by everything, including, of course, lockdown. How do they create a, a show in lockdown that makes it worthwhile, that still has a ticket price to it and a, and a value ticket price? Well, they put loads of shows on and have loads of people through the doors, all socially distanced, and it creates this kind of warehouse where there's lots of different shows going on and every 20 minutes I think it is they get a new audience in and they go through this kind of journey and then he adapts that into um, I think that in Chicago I think that is he adapts that and brings it back into one venue but makes it work in this kind of this experiential thing again but not going through it because it's not socially distanced but but around the 360 stage I'm sorry I'm giving you too much information and you're probably going what is he talking about You'll find out again when I talk to him and when you read the book. I came away from this book feeling fed. I felt that I'd been educated. And by fed, I mean that I'd, I was satiated. I felt satisfied. I felt that I was better as a magician because I'd read this book. Because I have big gaps in my experience. And, and part of that is that I do have stuff that I, sh I want to be able to do on stage but technically I'm not sure how to do it and it's not about big illusions but I've learned again from them. He has a very good story about how he got into the whole cruise ship thing and how he respects that you know it's easy with people sniffy about cruise ships and go no he loves them yes at one point he wanted to move on and do different things but he'll always go back to them because it's a place where you can do huge West End style shows regularly constantly and and you know, keeping your foot in there and always developing whilst practicing your and, and maintaining your original material. Uh, he talks about Jonathan Blackburn, who's an agent he got that sort of changed his life in many ways and, and also in mine, because <laughs> he's got this great success story. I've got the other way around. I did a show, died on my ass, quite rightly so. I was completely inexperienced and, uh, and was told not by Jonathan Blackburn, by the ship he'd sent me on, that they never wanted me on the ship again, which is very funny. But that was a long time ago, 20 years. And... Uh, and let's say I've learned my lesson. But the, the, the parallels and the kind of differences of these stories is, um, was just great to read. Okay, you'll find out more in the interval by the time, interval, interview, by the time I've put this out, uh, there, that might be out or it might not be, but you'll be able to find it easily. There'll be the podcast as well, Steve Fulton's Magic Show, which I'll put links below when I've launched that, uh, which the full interview will be on. So please check that out. Now, wherever you get your podcasts, and thank you so much to Jamie for writing this. There is so much more to say on this. And I, again, I don't want to do a 25 minute video. I probably have already. Oh, the Peppers Go stuff, you know, all that brilliant work ethic. The essays, the essays on work ethics, producing a show, the details, all the stuff at the end where he goes, right, every single part of the show, we're going to look at all of that. And then we've kind of, you know, the actual production of it. Anyway, I'm starting again. I've got to stop. Really recommended. It's... As he says, if I'm going to, you know, pull it apart a little bit, people said, you never say anything negative. Well, I wouldn't have read the book if I thought it was negative. It's massive. Yeah, you look at a book like that, it's not easy to read. You're not going to be taking that on the train. But I will say the photos, when they're blown up to that size, I found really effective. I was looking at the photos when he's talking about his, you know, the um, Stargate chapter where he's talking about performing in clubs and these pictures of this kind of, clubs where they've got the old style pint glasses excuse me old style pint glasses and people having a fag watching the show i found them really nostalgic beautiful pictures not that they're amazing quality some of them are but some of them are old pictures but just being that size i really felt i connected to them in a different way and his writing as he says he's not a writer it's something he finds difficult but i found that it was informal to make me connect with him as a person i could really feel who he was and which made it so much better than someone who's just, you know, maybe got it all clipped and perfect, but feels a bit formal. Every single thing uh, in this book is great. Um, again, if I'm picking it apart, I'd like to have had a little bit of glossary on all the lighting terms he uses, because I really want to learn about that. But then I can go and do a course and look on YouTube. So there you go. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, everybody. Go and have a look at onlinemagic.co. If you like this, you will love that. 800 videos plus, like and subscribe. And all the links will be below uh, this is a bargain. It's not a cheap book, but you'll get a lot from it. Take care.